Hello, everyone. Um, Hello. Dr. Paul Royce will be speaking next. He's joining us remotely from Australia. He couldn't be here today. Um, but Paul, please take it away. Okay. So, uh, yep. Good morning, everyone. Um, I apologize for not being able to attend in person. I had uh, work commitments in Australia and also my, my son's wedding. Uh, that's finished with now. So uh, I look forward to be able to get to uh, Zurich for, for one of the uh, follow-on meetings. What I wanted to do with this uh, presentation was to give a quick overview of the state estimation and the status of the work in PX4. Um, just providing an overview of the of the state estimator and then uh, move on to describing the major uh, changes that have been made in the past 12 months and also the plans we have in the next 12 months to improve the robustness and functionality of the system. So I'm gonna move across to a screen share now. Okay, you should be able to see the uh, screen share. Okay. So for those of you that, that aren't familiar with the state estimation or the term state estimation, state estimation is the process of determining the vehicle attitude, orientation, if you like, you know, which can be expressed as a roll pitch or yaw, uh, the, the velocity of the vehicle, um, its position, and then we also have additional states which describe the errors or biases in our sensors, uh, the Earth's magnetic field vector, and also we estimate wind velocity depending on the uh, sensor fit. And all of this estimation is performed using what's called an extended Kalman filter algorithm. And this is a 24 state algorithm. It's the most complex piece of software that we have on the PX4 flight stack. It's about 6,800 lines of code. And we've had 41 contributors uh, to the code base since it was uh, uh, created in, uh, I think, uh, 2016. The, we, one of the uh, uh, items to note there is that we compute attitudes internally using quaternions uh, to avoid uh, gimbal lock. And all of these states are available on the, are published by the UORB and are available in the uh, flight logs. What I'll do now is explain to you or describe the architecture for the UKF, because this is something there that makes the estimator that we have in our code base um, unique in the sense that it achieves uh, two objectives um, using a, a novel combination of algorithms. The one objective is that it's able to take data from different points in time that are misaligned in, in time because all of our sensors have different time delays and coming in at different rates. And it's able to bring them together and fuse them at a common time horizon. It's also able to output attitudes, uh, velocities, positions, you know, the vehicle states, and produce a very up-to-date estimate, you know, from the IMU data that doesn't suffer that suffers from minimum latency and lag. And at the top of the screen, we have what we call the EKF, the extended Kalman filter algorithm. And you see that the most important piece of data for our state estimation is the IMU. And this is a, an important point to remember when you're uh, setting up a system and when you're trying to uh, debug uh, poor navigation performance, that the most important sensor for state estimation is the IMU. And it's important that it be properly isolated from vibration and effects like flipping and aliasing. So we take the IMU data we uh, accumulate, we downsample it, it goes into a buffer. And all of our other sensor data also goes into these buffers. And, the idea, and what the buffers do, and the buffers aren't very long, they're between 100 and 200 milliseconds worth of data contained in a buffer. What the buffer enables us to do is to 
take the data from our other sensors, like our barometer, like the optical flow or the GPS or the magnetometer, and then use them to correct the motion that's been calculated from the IMU at the correct time for that piece of sensor data. So by using buffers, we're able to bring data together at the correct point in time. Also note that the way that we use the IMU data is we do, we run an inertial navigation calculation using the IMU data, and then we correct it using the data from the other sensors. So, and we also calculate an estimate of the uncertainty in our state estimates. What we get out of the EKF is a state estimate that's between 100 and 200 milliseconds old. So we have another, but that's too, that's too old and has too much latency to be used in our control loops. So the novel design feature with the PX4 estimator is that we then take the IMU data and we use it immediately to calculate uh, an attitude, a velocity of position using an inertial navigation uh, calculation. We then buffer that calculation. I'll move back, sorry about that. We then buffer the calculation and we then compare it to the EKF data um, at a common time horizon. We then have a correction, we calculate corrections and we apply those corrections back to the input data to the INS in the output predictor. And, the, and what these corrections do is they compensate for the errors in the inertial data. And that means that we have outputs which come out uh, at current time, which are calculated very quickly after we receive IMU data with less than 100 microseconds of latency. But those outputs are stopped from drifting. These estimates are stopped from drifting because the output predictor tracks the output from the EKF at the EKF time horizon. So we have an EKF and we have an output predictor. And when you look in your data logs, the EKF states are in the, you'll see the, uh, we have e e the estimated status message in the logs. That contains the EKF states. The outputs from the predictor, they're contained in messages like the vehicle attitude or the vehicle local position. So it's important to understand that when you look at your estimated status message and look at those states that are logged, that those states are delayed between 100 to 200 milliseconds from real time. Now, the, in terms of the status of the project, and I'll move through this very quickly. Um, the code base is, is, is sort of stabilized in the last 12 months, and the focus is now shifting from improving functionality to improving robustness of the uh, software. So in the past 12 months, we've had 20 enhancements, we've had a number of 24 bug fixes, we've had some housekeeping changes. We still, we have two pull requests open, and we've got 13 open issues. Um, two minor bugs, and then uh, we've got four uh, potential bugs. These are available on GitHub for you to uh, look at. You can look at the ECL uh, EKF, go to the ECL library, and you'll be able to sort by issue type and, uh, and, and look to see if those issues are things which uh, uh, would concern you for your operations. But we've focused on trying to improve the robustness and stability of the code. Um, uh, in the past 12 months, and we're shifting the focus uh, uh, to doing that rather than uh, integrating uh, new sensor types. Now, what do we have? We have, in terms of, uh, we've had some three major enhancements go through in the last 12 months. Uh, the first one, and this is quite significant, is that we've been able to reduce the latency from the receipt of the IMU data to the output of the vehicle attitude by an order of magnitude, and it's now under 100 microseconds. And we did this, moving back to the architecture, we did this by changing the order of calculations so that the first calculation that's performed when the EKF, uh, when the estimator receives IMU data is it runs this output prediction INS 
and then it sends those outputs, publishes those outputs, so they're available to the attitude and the other controllers, and that's done immediately. We then complete the other calculations for the EKF, which can take up to two milliseconds to complete, and then um, perform the corrections. But the output prediction runs immediately, and then we immediately publish through to the vehicle attitude um, uh, message. We've also added terrain height estimation using optical flow sensing. Now, that's a significant feature because we've tested that on a fixed wing and rotary wing using the a little PMW 3901 flow sensor. It's, it's showed on those platforms that it's able to provide a, a, a height at touchdown accurate to within about 25 centimetres to, to half a metre accuracy um, and actually good enough to be able to uh, schedule a flare manoeuvre on fixed wing. It does require motion uh, to measure height, but if you do have an optical flow sensor and you enable it and you, you turn off use of optical flow for navigation, then the EKF will use that optical flow to estimate the terrain offset. We've also uh, added uh, support for use of heading from um, dual antenna RTK GPS receivers. It's been tested on a Trimble uh, MB2 GPS with good results. And, and this is part of our part of the work and the long-term plan to reduce the reliance on magnetometer data. Uh, magnetometer data is one of the major sources of sensor error and sensor faults for uh, anomalies, so flight anomalies, particularly when operating near large building structures or, or large vehicles. So if you, for platforms that are able to accommodate the cost and, and the weight associated with this type of GPS receiver, this provides a good method of uh, eliminating reliance on um, a stable magnetic field. The next uh, item uh, to cover are the uh, bug reports. We still have two um, open uh, in the system. I mean, we never close these out as fast as you close them. Um, we have new, new issues are reported. We have one issue where using these uh, wider field of view flow sensors like the PMW3901, that height estimation can be degraded if the vehicle has, uh, if the vehicle's tilting and changing its tilt angle. Uh, this isn't something that's occurred on all vehicle types um, or all setups, and it's something that we're awaiting further testing to quantify the issue. We also have an issue with fixed wing VTOL platform types that if operating in, in high wind conditions, that the initial wind velocity estimate takes longer to converge than it should due to the way that the covariances are being initialised. And there's a fix in progress that's currently under um, evaluation. And that's, uh, now I don't know, uh, uh, Ramon, uh, are these slides going to be made available um, in terms of uh, PDF? Okay, great, we can put them up on the website because I've, inc I've included the links to these issues in the slides. So that uh, if people get them in electronic form, they'll be able to uh, click on the links and then and follow up the issues for themselves. Right. Okay, we have two outstanding pull requests. There's some miscellaneous optical flow changes that's in test and review and, um, and something quite recent uh, with, the, with the F7 and H7 uh, based uh, flight boards, processor flight boards, we now have the ability to uh, use double precision in the estimated calculations. And that is going to enable us to, um, to uh, use more aggressive tuning of the estimator, particularly tuning of some of the process uh, noise in the estimator um, without worrying about uh, uh, loss of stability in the covariance calculation due to the um, numerical uh, rounding errors. So we have a draft that's in draft at the moment and there's a, lot, uh, a fair bit more work to be done in terms of evaluating its effect and, and what we can do in terms of taking advantage of it with tuning parameters. In terms of future estimation work, as I've said before, we are going to focus on 
improving tolerance of sensor faults and improving overall robust robustness of the code base um, over and above in, uh, additional features and support for new sensors. Now, that's not saying that we won't be adding support for new sensor types, um, but the focus does now need to be um, more on um, robustness and uh, fault tolerance. So the areas there are, and, and these are just a, a list of items which we've uh, discussed in, in our estimation um, team. And that is that we would like to move to use of multiple EKF instances so that we can isolate, detect and isolate soft IMU sensor faults. Now, what I mean by a soft fault, a soft fault is one where the sensor produces data, but the, beta might, the data might be degraded due to a large change in sensor offset. And this wouldn't be detected by the, the hard fault uh, sensor selection uh, code in the, in the sensor module. We'd also like to use the, the full knowledge of the Earth's magnetic field for up and away flight to better uh, detect magnetometer errors. Um, certainly with larger platforms, we've noticed there's been an increase uh, with the use of larger platform types, and these have larger amounts of electromagnetic interference. And this will be a good time to add uh, a user adjustable correction for the uh, uh, to the magnetometer data based on the measured battery current. And then finally, we, we'd like to enhance the existing airspeed fault tolerance, which was introduced by pull request 11846. And we can do that by fusing in data from dual airspeed sensors and using the difference in between the innovations of those two sensors to determine which sensor has developed the fault. So we can monitor the difference between the two sensors when they develop a difference, we look at the innovations and that enables us to isolate the faulty sensor. And this will provide a, a, a more, a, a better uh, handling of airspeed faults uh, than, than what we currently have. The current method relies, is able to detect airspeed an airspeed that fails low, better than an airspeed failing high. And it handles it by switching off use of airspeed and going back to a, a pitch to throttle uh, relationship. We would like to have dual airspeed sensors and be able to fail over to the uh, second sensor. And in terms of uh, the one sensor top we would like to uh, um, add support for is a just generic range to beacon measurements, such as ultra wideband uh, RF tags or, or sonar. And these types of sensor systems are going to be very useful for recovery in, um, in adverse conditions, you know, where visibility for camera systems is blocked. And finally, we also want to improve the amount of test coverage, reversion testing for future changes, and also start to push up the level of test evidence required uh, for developers when they submit to future change requests. Okay, well, uh, that's the end of the presentation. So I'm available to uh, take some questions if there's time. Okay, thank you, Paul. Let me ask the audience. Uh, is there any questions for Dr. Paul? No one? Okay, can uh, we get an applause please for Dr. Paul? It's a bit hard to have a remote thank session. You.